Hi there, everybody. Thank you for coming today. I'm Chris Greenis. I'm with the Minnesota Hosting Association. I'm one of the board members. Um, and just to share a little bit what we have going on with Minnesota Hosting, we've got our adult convention and junior convention coming up in March. And then in April, we also have a sale coming up. So if anybody has anything they want to consign to that, get in touch with one of us. Um, but today, we have um, Jordan Seamers from Wisconsin. Um, as you can see, that he's got a a deep family of passion with the dairy industry, um, and he is also a sire analyst with Select Sires. So, if you guys would welcome Jordan Seamers. Thank you, everyone. It's kind of fun to be doing some of these uh, some of these tours uh, here uh, this week here for Minnesota Holstein. And when I asked, you know, what what should we present on, you know, everyone's like, well. Talk about your cows or talk about your farm and you know it's it's putting this together I put one presentation together and scrapped it I was like well that's not fun so we, we we're pretty humble people or try to think that we are and uh, so yeah you know we wanted to talk about things we've learned from breeding cattle mostly our mistakes because when, when you're when you're on the bleeding edge of a lot of these things you make mistakes and you make them fast so I just want to share with you some of our mistakes and what we've learned from them Right, so I guess that's kind of the uh, the message here for today. So understanding Seamers Holsteins, like the video said, fifth and sixth generation farm, uh, established in 1890. Um, in the early 2000s, we we did a lot of crossbreeding. I was Mount Billiard Swedish Reds. In fact, my first show calves were uh, were Mick Max and Peters Lins and uh, those fancy bulls. So uh, yeah, I mean, it worked in our system. We had mattresses with sawdust over the top and. Our Holsteins were maybe too big in their frames, and uh, they just were, they just weren't working for us. Uh, but when we flipped the dairy in 2009 from those mattresses to deep bedded sand, uh, we found that the Holsteins we did have were making about 5,000 pounds of lactation over our crossbred cows. Pretty easy math. Got to flip it over. Uh, with the help of some show embryos that my aunt bought, uh, that got us back into the registered Holstein game. You know, and uh, right right kind of when we like that you know 0809 area. Um, a couple things happened. Genomics came out in January of 2009. So that was something that we started dabbling with and thinking about. We knew in order to flip the dairy from crossbreds to Holsteins, immediately we had to figure out how to make embryos work. So we had the first satellite location for Transova, right? So uh, we, we, we got to learn really fast um, in an area that was kind of unknown, uh, basically out of necessity. So necessity is the uh, the father of all invention, and that's uh, probably the case at our uh, at our family uh, farm as well. So current scope uh, right now, like a 4,800 cow dairy, uh, milking on three locations. Uh, we run about 7,500 acres, um, one centralized calving site. So we, we try to do a, a job at all of our at all of our dairies. We have some dairies that are high uh, high labor, high intensity dairies. Um, you know, mainly the, the main commercial dairy, so we're, that's where we're putting a in a lot of the embryos. It's where we have our fresh cows. So we try to centralize our best people at, at, at our main location. Um, we have a centralized calving site so that, again, we're, co we're consolidating labor. Baby labor is easy to find here in this part of Minnesota, uh, but uh, the other parts of Minnesota I've asked so far, everyone laughs at me, so nobody's laughing at me here. Uh, <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Uh, we also put in about 200 embryos a week. Uh, that uh, it's kind of an aggressive, an aggressive push. So probably half of those embryos are from select sires. Uh, like I said before, you know, like like Chris said, I do work for select sires yet. Uh, part of uh, part of our family is that in order to come back to the dairy and be a part of ownership someday, we're forced to work off the farm. It's just it's just that simple. So uh, while while I was in uh, uh, in college. I, uh, um, I took a job with Select Sires as a Holstein Sire Analyst, and I love that job so much, I just keep doing it every day. So I'm still at the dairy full-time, I'm at Select full-time. As far as how I split my hours, I keep getting that question. I don't really know either, I just keep working. Um, so that's a lot of fun. I love both jobs. I love the opportunity to be able to do that every day. Our current RHA is just over 36,000, like a 4.3 and a 3.1. Um, we're also shipped to Lando Lakes at two of our locations. Uh, it's, you know, quota system there right now. And uh, one of our dairies is an agriculture dairy. So 
just uh, just kind of <coughs> how things are right now. So starting with type, what has type taught us, right? Our family has always had a deep passion in, 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 in the better kind of cattle. So breeding lesson number one, learn this mistake pretty early in the game. Extreme times extreme doesn't make it right. Wow, did we think that we were on to something, you know, taking, we, you know, we thought that, oh, you know, if we make a six-point tight bolt, everyone's going to use them. Turns out nobody's going to use them because they're too extreme. You know, nobody wants to milk, you know, milk some of those things. So we learned that type is not an arms race. Um, whether it's show type or genomic type, right, at the end of the day, we still have to milk whatever is not marketable. It goes for, for most every dairy uh, that, that play in, um, you know, in the genetic circuit, and that goes for you know pretty pretty much any genetic circuit that you're in. You have to you have to um, uh, be, be sustainable with your mistakes. Uh, we learned that swinging for the extremes is, gives us too many outliers, right? Is what it is. So when when we were swinging so hard for the genomic type fence, and we we didn't like our results, so we had to find the kind of cattle that were the most profitable on our farm, and we had to learn how to like them. Right, and, and that, so that kind of retaught us some things on on type and how we look at cattle. I'm not saying type means you know the 95 point cow. Heck, there was a lot of 83 point uh, cows that taught us a lot of things. Mainly, fluidity through the hock, how cattle track. Right, we had, like I said, we had to rethink and retrain our brains on how we had to look at cattle, locomotion, how they move through the gate, in in. Upper Midwest here, a lot of cat most cattle are on concrete and, and free stalls, right? So we need easy moving cattle that can go to the parlor, get up and down, and, and, and are going to be free of problems, right? We need cattle that are tight in the toes, that way there's no splay toe going on. Uh, you know, enough width through the front end, so we're able to get enough, uh, enough forage in. Here in the Upper Midwest as well, this is very heavy forage diets. So we, we can't afford to be pounding um, a bunch of uh, bunch of high con high dollar concentrates into cattle. We need to push forage. Forage makes healthier cattle, and, and uh, uh, you can you can make a lot more marginal milk that way. Again, on the production. So we entered the milk quota era here uh, a couple of years ago with Lando Lakes. It's becoming the new norm. Where do you find a milk market? It's becoming extremely difficult. We've been running like a three eight three nine uh, uh, butter fat, like a three zero to two nine protein. Um, because Lando Lakes is a fluid cap on our milk, we determined in order to ship more pounds of solids a day, because that's how we get paid, uh, well, that was not going to be an acceptable answer. We had to figure out how to get our, to get our test up while also maintaining flow, right? Because it's there's two sides to profit. You can either do big <coughs> widgets or, or high dollar widgets. How do you combine, right? It, it's the same with, with, make, with milking cows as well. So. Breeding for balanced production is more aligned with our future. We had never looked at component percentages growing up. It was all about pounds up, pounds down the driveway, pounds down the driveway. Um, you know, percent percent components didn't matter to us. I mean, our, 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 our milk plant is you know eight miles up the road. You know, trucking it was not a real it was not a cost. Right? It was just about how to ship more pounds out. And uh, now that again that we have this milk quota, it's how can we get more pounds of solids into the into the creamery? So. The other thing we also take a look at when we're selecting bulls and females is an adequate protein to fat ratio. We never know when we're going to be paid for protein or fat, so we just try to stay right down the line. That way, you know, if we, if we have really high protein cattle, you know, there have been protein crazes, right? The late 90s, the early, uh, the early 2010s, there were some protein crazes going on. And we chased it. I, I, we're guilty of it, right? But um, what we found is the more balanced that we are in our approach, we're not gonna. We're, we're gonna stay steady in our pursuits. So the proof is in the pudding. Took the screenshot right before we came up here. This is more where we're headed, right? Right now we're uh, we're averaging a, like a four four fat, like a three one protein, uh, still with about 110 uh, pounds of flow per day. That's not flow. That's not energy corrected. So we're we're pretty psyched up right now with uh, with some of these new crops of uh, cattle that we have calving in. Um, the direction that we're headed. Um, like I said, with, with genetics, you can move very, very quickly. So again, what has history taught us on health? So like that video, you know, they were kind of saying that we were like a 28, 2900 cow dairy. And I said that we're a 4800 cow dairy. 
the last 18 months, we've grown a couple of cows, right? And, and we've had to change the way we think. We used to think, oh, yeah, whatever. We want really good cows that can make a lot of flow, and if they have health problems, we'll figure it out. You know, not a big deal. And yeah, again, going back to this whole labor thing, it's kind of for real. So the invisible cow is a profitable cow. Cows that don't show up on your, on your health event chart, pretty cool. They're making, they're making dollars. So on the double off, so we sink all of our milk cows on a double off, and we put embryos on all of our cows. Major KPI is days open. So how do we get cattle to get pregnant and roll, right? The more, the more times we have to put an egg in them, that's arm service, that's embryos uh, uh, that we have to put in them, that stays open, right? So a lot of these things start to uh, start to compound. Um, on the rebreeds, you know, after they get so many eggs, you know, we, we cherry pick and we have an activity monitoring system as well. Uh, we'll breed them just to get our days open down. We gotta drive our days open. So that's why we're, you know, we we're chasing DPR right now where our DPR across the herd is not good enough. It's, it's actually minus on anti herd. What would your goal be for that? For days open? Where would you like your whole herd at if you could? And where are you at right now? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a million dollar question. So, days open right now, uh, probably like in that, in that 1, 130 range where we're at right now. Um, 130, 140, yeah, I'd like to drive that closer to, uh, yeah, closer to like 110. You know, one, just, just anytime you can just keep pushing it down, keep pushing it down the best you can. Um, so here we're building digesters right now. Um, we'll be switching to solids here uh, pretty soon and off sand. So another question that I keep getting is, did the digester company force you to do it or are you doing that yourself? Actually, the digester company has not forced us to, to do anything. Um, I feel like we're going to maybe be better managers because of it because so many people are moving towards it. Right, so in the genetic circle, sometimes you have to align yourself to where the direction of the industry is headed. And where the direction of, of industry is headed is betting on, on solids. So if everyone else is doing it, we need to learn how to do it. Um, are we psyched up to do it? No, no. You know, we, uh, uh, but, but we think we're going to be better managers because of it. You know, it's like when we all had to come up BST, we figured out how to get milk out of cows. I, I, it's one of those things, there's a lot of people that are doing it that are very successful doing it. Uh, breeding lesson number three, yeah, breeding for health will never go out of style. Yeah, at Twin Spruce, labor situation really good. The rest of us, it's a little touch and go. <laughs> so some of the genetic markets, genetic markets explored. Uh, Crossbreeding, like I said, grew up with Mondelier Swedish Reds. Um, we export a lot of F1 embryos overseas. There's a demand for, uh, for Holstein Jersey uh, embryos in some, uh, some bizarre markets. Obviously, we're kind of in the epicenter around this area of a lot of F1 dairies, right? Holstein Jersey crosses. Um, so we've, we've been there. We, we, um, we don't you know, have that for our own dairy because it doesn't fit our model, right? Every dairy has its own footprint on what's going to maximize total profit. And for us, it didn't work. For some people, they know their, they know their models to a T. It works. So we're not going to sit up here and poo-poo anybody's idea of a perfect cow because Dairy to dairy, it's it's so different. We did a lot of single trait single trait chasing without balancing, right? So we chased the, the PTAT thing as hard as we could, thinking that that was going to make better cattle. Well, yeah, we left so many traits behind us. We left cell score behind us. We left DPR behind us. You know, we left milk in the dust. So we were able to use a lot of those three tips um, and, and get out of that glut. We still like type, but we're going to make sure that we balance it. Uh, the best we can. Like I said, we, we chased that we chased protein in the protein craze. Thought that was a cool idea. No, that wasn't. Um, high risk mating is about a goal. So, you know, in the seed stock industry, we get we get a lot of flack. You know, all you genomic guys, you just breed high on high. You know, you don't you don't actually balance things out. You don't actually look at it. Well, yeah, we used to. Yeah, you're, you're not wrong. Like I'm not gonna sit up here and lie to you, but uh, now there's more and more. As people start learning more and more about themselves and more about their dairies, once you have a clear focus, you start developing, you know, an arsenal of tools to put together. Uh, uh, pick, you know, find a bunch of bulls and females to kind of work for your model. And then you just start working them in. There's a lot of high, you know, super high females that rank at our farm. 
that we don't use because I don't like their traits. I don't like where they where they where they come from. So we just leave them to the side because they they do not fit our goal and our mission. All right. So current goals. You know, we're like I said, we're going to stay on the uh, the TPI. Um, PTAT bulls. That's uh, it's very important to us. It's kind of our bread and butter kind of stuff, right? Like I said, we we, we like better cattle. We like it's what we love. Um, second second one being balanced TPI production bulls, right? We understand there's there's a big appetite for those kind of bulls, and we can't uh, we can't you know saturate both markets. We, we try to 200 embryos a week where we're really trying to push uh, uh, all the avenues of marketing as possible. You'll notice what don't you see up here? Net merit. We found net merit does not work in our case, right? Net merit, we don't believe in the body size composite. We need we need a bigger calf, a little bit more motor um, that we're able to put more forage through. Uh, that merit doesn't account for oh, front and center, Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. Going on. Uh, you know, some of these net merit things they don't account for cell count. They don't account for uh, mastitis resistance. Some of these some of these health traits that. We're really chasing, so we think that TPI is a little bit better job, but uh, does a little bit better job for us. We market a lot of embryos globally, like I said. Uh, right now, working on some big, uh, some big projects in Slovakia, Russia, Brazil, Argentina, and China. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a very nice market for us, um, and we do still do some select show stock for no other reason than we like it still, um, still like it, and it allows us to, to uh, you know, if you can sell a, a calf too, and you can talk about bulls for us. It's, it's more of a more of a marketing uh, play than uh, than anything, and um, you know I'll touch on it a little bit later. But our best return on investment is still the show calves, right? We only make a certain you know 20 per per show season, but it's a very stable rate of return, right? Because it, it's like stocks and bonds, right? The, the the genomic side is more the stock market, the type side is more the bond market. We always need frozen embryos and in inventory that don't depreciate. So we, we, we use some of these, these show embryos, keep them in the tank for when we have a bad IVF day, and uh, it, it's just a very stable rate of return. So again, you know, touching on some of these key families, um, there in uh, like 2010, uh, we were, like I said, we were just getting into uh, some of these genomic, uh, some, of the, some of this genomic game. Uh, it was a tough year on the farm for us uh, that year, and my dad and I really wanted to purchase this male man, so we were sitting there at the, uh, at the World Classic at Madison, and you know she, she reached a certain level where we were like, no, we don't have any more of the coffers. And uh, my mom was with us uh, that that uh, that night, which is weird. She normally doesn't do that stuff, and she's a very staunch, you know, uh, Dutch lady. And uh, we don't we don't question what uh, what Janina says, but uh, anyways, <laughs> she, uh, she she elbowed my dad in the ribs and said, I don't care what you do, you're just going to buy that that calf. And uh, what? So this is kind of Janina's cow that we always joke about. Um, this cow's probably put about 30 sons and grandsons in AI. Uh, been very, very instrumental for us. One daughter at 95, a bunch of daughters at 94. Some some highlights, you know, Rosline being a renegade son dam of uh, Pazzle, um, you know, at, at Select. Rosa was a high uh, RZG German bull. Then Rolex is a high uh, LPI bull up at, at the CMEX. Uh, Man of Man Rouse cow family. Haven't uh, haven't seen them be you know continue to be prolific because of their inability to IVF. Um, it, it's funny how you need cattle to you know proliferate and, and, and make a lot of uh, make a lot of copies to get more swings at the plate. You know we, we pay per embryo, but still you need you need a bunch of swings at the plate in order to in order to pop them. But love the cow family. Every time we can try to to bring them back into the fold, we do. You know, we're, uh, we'll dip a little bit lower if we really like uh, cattle sometimes. So here are some, uh, some daughters, granddaughters. Count the upper left-hand corner is that book that just went 95. Uh, count on the right is a maternal sister by McCutcheon. She's the dam of the uh, Rubicon of the bottom left-hand corner, dam of uh, Razum there at, at Blondin. And the cow at the right is uh, uh, Delta S. Razan, former number one uh, heifer in the breed. She's 93 now. She didn't really make anything. She was really high. She still is really high, but she doesn't like IVF things. So, what are you going to do? So, another key uh, family, uh, Mogul Hanker. So, Mogul Hanker kind of has a fun story as well. In uh, in 2014, um, we had been 
um, you know, playing you know the genomic game now for for five for four or five years, and uh, we missed out on this bull called mogul. Guys can all think that's funny, right? You know, but but the early moguls, you know, they had, they had them short heads and they were they were ugly calves. You know, ugly calves don't like cows, so of course why would we use them? Uh, but then they started calving in, and well, they had these really good udders. So at, at Expo time in 2014, there was this uh, mogul hanker cow up for sale in, in uh, party party of the planet sale. And she wasn't high TPI, she wasn't high PTAT, but we knew we needed to, to own the cow for whatever reason. Um, so when, we, when we, we got the cow bought, we brought her home, and we determined that the best cross at the time was Monterey. You know, it was, it was another, it was a bull that matched at her level of TPI and her level of height, and it really fit what we wanted to do. So we did that, that mating five times in the dish, and I want to say there's like 50 or 60 full sisters. Um, we didn't. We, we knew we, that with that mating, we were going to get some some iterations of the kind of cattle we wanted to make. So we were just going to force it to happen. You know, you never know. You know, some sometimes there's a one in a million chance if you get one embryo, one calf. You know, weird stuff happens. But if you really want to force something to happen, it's no different than life. You just kind of got to force it to happen. So, Mogul Hanker's been a been a big TPI PTAT matriarch. That's a handful of. Uh, Handful of bulls that I actually wanted to put on the screen here today that, that are out of this cow family. We're, uh, we're very proud of this cow family, and uh, anything you do with this cow family, they're going to do. They IVF like machines, and um, whatever direction you take them, they, they run with it. So, been a very cool cow family. So, here are some of those uh, some of those daughters. Cow in the upper right hand corner is Luster 33317. Um, her dam is the dock in the bottom right hand corner, but that Luster up there. She's punching out uh, calves right now, uh, over 3,000, over three and a half on tight and pulled. So, you know, I'm going to touch on, we, we work in gene expression a little bit, right? We try to get our frequency of genes up and an area for, uh, for the future that, that we're finding right now, where we're identifying is pulled and red. And how do we ex go into those avenues um, with a lot of our black and white cow families? How do we, how do we work into those markets and do some of the same things we're doing, right? So we're, uh, we, we've been working on some of those markets and we're very excited for, uh, for the future of those, of those industries as well. Down the upper right hand corner is a dock um, out of one of those Monterey's. She's 94 uh, and then she's the dam of Happen and Have It All at AI Total. Two cows on the right are maternal sisters by dock. Down the bottom right hand corner is the dam of Hanans and Hanley at Select. Then the cow in the bottom left hand corner it's King Royal 28512. So like I said before, one of the things we're trying not to do anymore is high risk matings. That white cow is a high risk mating. King Royal, King Royal, Jedi Mogul. That's three shots of Miri. I mean it is tight. But again, one of these questions that keeps coming up at these meetings is well, what do you think about inbreeding? Is, is inbreeding gonna ruin the breed? Christian Balteca is working right now at there, he's at NC State, a PhD in studying inbreeding and working with Holstein USA and um, you know, a lot of the things that we know about inbreeding and the models that we use are from the 1960s. <laughs> it's, so it's entertaining, and, and he calls inbreeding runs a homozygosity. It's a different way of thinking, right? You know, so when we're lining up genes, are we lining up, you know, the, the long way? We can, we got to cross them over and get deleterious <coughs> alleles. And what he keeps saying is, some inbreeding is good. A lot of inbreeding can be really good. Some inbreeding can be bad. Some inbreeding can be really bad. So we know we know just as little now as what we did in the 1960s. So um, the other thing that he keeps mentioning is if you take you can use inbreeding as a tool to combat to combat inbreeding. So if there's some really inbred bulls, some really inbred females that are not related, if you cross them back over to themselves, you're you're, in, you're you should be under the average um, inbreeding for the uh, for the entire population because. The only thing they're related to themselves is they're not related to themselves. So it's a it's an interesting mindset, and, it, and we're going to have to. It's going to take some time to get some out of some of our old habits to think about inbreedings in new ways. So as more as we explore more about some of these biotechnologies, the more we realize that we don't know. It's honesty. So another another key family in, in uh, is the Lambda Paris cow family. So in that same uh, sale that we bought Mogul, uh, Mogul Hanker in, 
We also uh, were trying to buy a cow by the name of Facebook Paris. Um, we could not get her acquired, but they were also selling her baby calf uh, uh, by Sired by Tangle. It was kind of a goofy pedigree, and she was, it was more of an afterthought investment, uh, to be completely honest. And so we brought the Tango home, worked her to a bunch of different bulls, and um, ended up working her to uh, Mobile Denver, uh, which the mating makes sense after the fact. You know, we were, like I said, we were swinging for the fences, just trying to make high on high, right? We didn't have a goal, we didn't have a plan. Um, but something stuck in the wall and we're, we're blessed, but that mogul Denver made, made a lot of sense. Gave a lot of horsepower through the front end, just opened the cow up, and uh, um, that tango just needed a big shot of milk and a big shot of strength, so the mating worked. However, the problem with 20, you know, those, the, there was a pair of sisters that were both in the top 10 of the breed, and not a single AI unit would touch them because they were both you know, 12, 15 on calving ease when bulls had to be under seven. So. Everyone walked away from them, and uh, we said, well, we have these high female, well, what do we do? So we worked in the sex semen to, to low to low calving these bulls and just hope for the best. Um, at the time, there was this bull called uh, Delta Lambda that we were using as a cleanup bull, but he was kind of cool. Um, he wasn't very high, he wasn't he wasn't the Delta Lambda we know today. Uh, frankly, yes, he was giving them away, you know, to use as a cleanup bull. And uh, I was in college at the time with Simon here, and uh, um, I was kind of a procrastinator in college, so I waited to do uh, matings there at the last minute, and uh, by the time my dad saw the matings, he uh, called me and kind of uh, kind of yelled at me, you could say, and said, we don't take the highest heifer in the breed, and we don't work her to uh, 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 to, to our cleanup bull. You know, you got to be out of your mind. So I called the, uh, the, the customer service lady at Transova, and um, she said it's too late. You know the, the the dish is already burdened. Well, it's kind of been a a, a pretty pretty cool mistake. It seems like any uh, any good cow that that happens, it, it's from it's from mistakes or it's uh, there's good stories involved with all of it. So twenty seven eight fifty six is uh, she's kind of the matriarch of the farm right now. She's kind of uh, she's kind of a big deal. Um, so yeah, whack of daughters that are high. Um, there's 20 plus sons in AI, and there has to be 50 plus grandsons in AI. Uh, she she was one of the highest TPI PTAT uh, uh, cows in the breed. Uh, just a cow that, that hits every box that we want to make with her. If we're going to fault this cow family. I uh, just need to work on cell score on them. You know, the the, the like I said, our goals have, have shifted and changed. Now we now we need to focus on cell score. Uh, we're going to try to keep the type as best we can, but uh, there's some matings that work really good in this cow family, and other times where we just have to uh, to walk away from from some fun, just because we have goals now. So some show ring stars uh, that that Strans home tequila cow started her life here in Owatonna, Minnesota. The Stranskys, uh, we were able to acquire her from uh, from Milk Source. Uh, she's been kind of fun uh, export pile of eggs out of her there uh, every month, uh, that pure Kiana. So that cow started her life as a 79.2 year old. Yeah, no joke, you know, just, just a cow, I guess. I don't know what she was, but uh, got up one day and she caught someone's eye and turned into be a, a 95 point cow. And then the bottom right hand corner is a great red cow, kind of a, kind of a nice show cow. Like I said, we, our family still enjoy showing. We, we try to do less of it. We try to do more marketing of all the calves uh, that result from it. Um, however, uh, like I said, it has a great stable rate of return, and that's why we do it. Uh, we didn't have a lot of recepts, you know, like there was a, a kid that came up to me you know, last night at SDSU that, uh, that said, hey, you know, we want to get in, you know, we're a great herd, we want to get into, into registered cattle. What would you recommend that we do? I said, you need something stable, and something that, 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 you know, no matter how big or small that you are, it's going to just be a stable rate of return. So, but you know, but the, on the other token, so well, what what bull should I be using? And so we pulled out a couple bulls, and he's like, well, these aren't going to make show calves. And I'm like, eh, you're probably right. But at least at the end of the day, you're going to have a herd of cows that you want to milk. So, again, that goes back to extreme times extreme. Do do you use you know more stable bulls? Do you use more balanced bulls to to, to play the game? It's uh, yeah, it's a million dollar question. It's just a matter of how you want to skin the cat. So, uh, in February of last year, we, uh, we acquired Sandy Valley Farms. Um, 
Yeah, this has kind of been a, a really exciting, really exciting deal. When we first heard they were they were uh, for sale, we told ourselves uh, we we don't need a distraction. We need to stay focused on Land of Lakes herds to ship our milk to. Um, let's uh, let's stay around the area. And as we uh, kept hearing about uh, some some parts of the deal, yeah, we. we we were like, no, like, don't tell us about it because we don't want to hear about it because if we go up there and we like it, we might have to buy it. And uh, one day we, we ended up going up there and getting it bought. Um, so that's kind of fun. Kind of the upper right hand corner is fabulous. She's kind of an exciting third cat five year old for this year. Uh, up there, I think she was a 83.2 year old. Never seen a classifier since. We found her, she got up one day and we brought her back home. She was there for a couple weeks. She ended up going max score 92, 95 in the other. We're pretty excited about uh, that young cow. It's the same family as Ruby County Eternity. Bottom left hand corner is old uh, Cookies and Cream, the Daniel Challenger at CMEX. Cow on the right to the right of her is uh, Belisto Paradise, the Daniel Pharaoh at Slut Sires. Those are kind of a lot of their nature of cows. Cow right smack dab in the middle is a uh, fresh Parfect. Um, Junior and Ashley, they just uh, sold a IVF session out of this cow in their last sale. So we're very excited about uh, some of these fresh, fresh Parfects. What I really like about this cow uh, is kind of kind of what we were hoping for with Parfect, right? She's got a tremendous amount of power, in, in, you know, up front, a lot of horsepower. Um, she's got a tremendous amount of whip there through her hooks, pins, and thurls, right? And if you look at her leg, how that's constructed, she tracks extremely straight from the rear, right? So there, those, those feet are gonna hit the same holes, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of set to the hop, right? She's fluid in the way she walks, so for us, you know, everyone talks about the udder, you know, but uh, for, for me looking at her, I'm trying to find those little things that I'm going, yes, we nailed it. Yes, we nailed it. So we're pretty excited about, uh, pretty excited about these. Then the cow in the bottom right hand corner, I came in uh, over there on the directories, that's the cow in the Slex Irish directory, that's, uh, that's Brass Escanaba. She's the, uh, the dam of a bunch of uh, bulls there for Sandy Valley, uh, for the Bowers. Uh, but I think that cow could be one of the new faces of Sandy Valley. Uh, a cow that's not super high in her own right. She's, she's maybe 29, 2950, 29 and a quarter. Nice cow, uh, but she's starting to uh, throw a bunch of calves right now, over 3100, 3150 uh, lately. Again, a cow that's a little bit different. A cow that we like. We like IVF and cows because you, you know what you're dealing with. Right, so in the in the land of genomics, everyone says, "Oh, you, you all you guys do is is uh, get on these calves so early and try to make them high." Well, yeah, once in a while you need you need cows uh, to be able to, you know, hone your matings back in and do a bunch of setup matings because it's not always about making bull, making bull, making bull. It's about the setup generations and the subsequent generations that come from it. So we're uh, uh, yeah we're very excited about the Sandy Valley endeavor and uh, uh, really like the team that we have on board there. So some of our goals, right? Like I said, we're goal oriented. So I'll be involved in the genetic uh, markets of the future. Which formula does that mean? Today I would say that that uh, that it's you know TPI HHP dollars. You know the select HHP dollar index, which accounts for it doesn't really care the size of your cattle, and it double counts for mastitis, right? So we try to look at formulas that make the most sense to us. Then we weed off bulls based on single trait culling of bulls that are too extreme that, that just don't fit our model. So we, uh, uh, we, we, we take a lot of time picking bulls because there, there's nothing more important in moving your genetic program forward quite like bull selection. Because generation one, that's 50% of your, of your genetic makeup of your herd. Two, 75%, and three, 87%. You know, you're moving so fast that the cheapest investment you can make on your farm is semen. Point blank, no doubt in my mind. Other high interest rates for us, um, A2A2. We don't actually believe in it, but in order to have bulls, you know, uh, uh, right now to go into in the stud, uh, they almost have to be A2A2. Um, Europe is going to start uh, uh, basically demanding that all bulls imported into Europe are A2A2. Uh, Australia the same way, uh, China, Japan same way. So by default, we're breeding for it, but our our milk gets pulled at the creamery, so it's not, the creamery's not paying for it, so not something that really interests us, but we're doing it on accident. Um, red, like I said before, we're playing with it. Um, 
Europe and, and uh, Japan and some other countries do not allow the importation of bulls and semen with colon in the pedigree. So Bull well, Avalanche, for instance, which is a major player in the, in the red breed right now, is everywhere. So how do we make bulls without Avalanche or colon in the pedigree that are marketable? So we're, we're working on that and trying to, trying to increase our gene frequency on red. Uh, we have some, uh, some bulls here that are going to be marketed uh, relatively soon that we're very proud of. Similar to, you know, like I said before, about getting rid of BST, move, moving off sand on the solids. <coughs> some of these things are going to make us better. So we, we took that to heart and we're uh, really chasing after how can we be better? Same with pole. Pole and red, we kind of do the same way. We're going to try to go into those markets the same way that uh, we went into the genomic type. PTAT or the, the PTAT TPI uh, uh, sphere. And we're going to just start trying to, uh, to to move into those markets. And, for, and and finally, functional type will always be our foundation. Why? Good cows never go out of style. Good cows last the test of time. And the, and the older cows that you can have in your herd, the less heifers you have to uh, to be feeding on the back end. Less overhead that uh, you have uh, across your entire operation being more profitable. So, what's next for uh, for Seamers Holsteins? Uh, right now, we're planning a dairy expansion with Sioux Dairy Construction there out of Western Iowa. We're going to be building a 5,500 cow bar tunnel vent uh, that we're uh, very excited about. Hopefully, uh, we're pushing uh, cows in that wheel on Christmas Day. Like the coolest thing ever. Um, yeah, looking for open heifers and uh, we're looking for fresh heifers uh, quarter one, quarter two of 2024. You know, so uh, uh, that uh, that barn is going to be going behind our current facilities. We're going to to dig transfer lines. There's a uh, there's a creek that runs between our two dairies. We're going to dig a trans transfer line um, under the creek. Uh, that's also going to feed the rotor or the the the, um, the digesters. We're going to be putting in a nutrient separation system where one third of that manure stream is going to be turned um, into stream dischargeable water. Another third is going to be called like a sweet water or tea water. That's going to be uh, uh, mild, um, mild nitrogen, not super hot. So after after we take uh, um, our alfalfa off, be able to run a wheel right on that and uh, and get that a nice shot of uh, nitrogen water. That's not going to burn it. And then the uh, the final third is going to be a, a six percent solid product that's still pumpable um, that we'll be able to uh, put on trucks and be able to justify putting manure on trucks a long distance. So. Um, we live in an order score county, so in order to expand, we have to do some of these things. We had to put up the digester to expand. We have to put in nutrient separation to expand. We have to have enough acres on our permit um, that, that's above and beyond the DN, you know, our, our Department of Natural <coughs> Resources um, you know, qualifications to expand. So our county has probably more teeth in, in saying what we can or cannot do above the Department of Natural Resources um, at the state level. So we have to be very compliant uh, with a lot of these things. And the reason for, for this expansion, because that's the other question, why, if it's so tough, why are you doing it? So we're going into this expansion, our parlor is old as snot, right? It's, a, it's, it, it's junk. Um, it's older than I am, it, hasn't, it, it gets 40 minutes off a day, and it's an old bullmatic reel. We can't put in a vertical lift because our, our ceiling's too low and, and our uh, return lanes are too narrow. So, and there's not another spot in the dairy to put it. So if we're gonna be spending all this money to try to stick a parlor somewhere at our main site, we, we determined that we wanna probably get away from the parallels in the future. And uh, uh, we kept coming out here to um, this I-29 corridor and looking at, looking at a lot of these new modern facilities, the wheels that they're putting up and uh, how to have a more efficient unit. So, you know, in our genetic business, more uteruses that we have under our nose, the more we'll be able to keep uh, to keep turning the crank. So um, it, it's three legs of the stool. Sustainability in, in, in the biogas or whatever you want to call it is one. You know, making milk is two, and uh, genetics would be three. So trying to make a platform where if uh, one of those markets uh, is not having an awesome year, the other two uh, need to drag it forward. So it's kind of where we're headed. So careers. So it's kind of funny last night I put the slide together. Um, apparently this is our, our old intern and our new intern at the bar there uh, a couple weeks ago. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so these two boys are from South Dakota State, uh, Minnesota natives. So we're constantly looking for new and exciting talent. Um, you know, whatever, whatever talent may be, you know, uh, uh, we're, 
my, my, my father and my uncle have always been of the belief of you can do whatever you want with your hair. If you're talented enough, you need to be the champion of a project. We don't care what, what that what that project is as long as it's generating money. So, you know, we're, we're like, like I said, Lucas, uh, um, Lucas was at SDSU, interned us there in 2021. He was working in this Wilbur, the Wilbur region here until like a couple weeks ago. And uh, uh, now he's, uh, he's come uh, uh, to, to Wisconsin. He wants to really take over the CAF and uh, uh, heifer management program. We really don't have anybody in those spaces. We just kind of overlap and hope for the best. He really wants to take that over. Ross, he has a bunch of ideas that he wants to, uh, to look at here at his internship. You know, in the future, I wouldn't be shocked if uh, we move to in-house, um, um, uh, you know, putting in embryos in-house. Uh, my girlfriend's in vet school right now, and that's her goal. She wants to put in our embryos for us. So we'll be looking for an embryologist or somebody uh, in that capacity to help us out. And I don't, we're, we're a big family organization, do a lot of things together where we really don't care where anybody comes from. It doesn't bother us. As long as everyone has the, uh, the right attitude, it's all good by us. So with that, I just want to thank you here for your time and uh, I guess open for any questions that you all might have. Jordan, you said when you were chasing type, you were getting a cow you didn't like. Yes. What, what was the cow? What were you getting? So we were probably getting 70 inch cows that had no chest and no milk. No barrel, you know, just that, that extreme type, you know, type PTAT had been historically so tied to stature that that's what we were chasing incidentally. You know, we weren't looking at the linear, or, oh yeah, type PTAT, you know, like, so when we look at, at PTAT bulls now, we try to really limit our stature because we, we know in our, in our, you know, in our real parlor, you can't have cows that are too big, but we, we know where our, uh, uh, where our sweet spot is. We don't mind big cows, like I keep saying. You know, that, that doesn't bother us, but we knew 70 inch cow, that wasn't gonna work either. You know, and uh, um, we also went through that stage of that spastic paralysis, that, that fused hock in the leg. You know, yes, I'd say a good chunk of that was management. We, we were trying to push calves too hard. Um, we were pushing them to free stalls too fast. You know, we were putting calves in free stalls at three and a half, four months of age, sand bedding. So, and we maybe weren't pushing up feed enough, so they'd constantly grind their feet in and, and uh, do a lot of that themselves, but a lot of it was genetic too, right? So we had to start weeding some of that stuff out and teaching ourselves that, that was not gonna be an acceptable answer. So, yeah, some breeding too extreme sometimes got that for us. And now when you're working for Select and selecting bulls for them, how does your formula for bull selection differ from the way you're breeding cows, or is it the same? It's relatively the same. It's relatively the same. You know, obviously we look at uh, um, try to try to fix bulls to the right markets, right? So, you know, Select is looking at this HHP index, right? They're they're very focused on cattle without problems. Um, the other one is is TPI, the third cheese merit, and then some of these balanced bulls, balanced TPI, balanced type. So a lot of the same things that we're, that we're looking at, they, they also are as well. They've also found that the more balanced the bull is, the better they sell. So our best selling bulls would be like Luster P. He's not a, he's not a world beater. You know, he's 27, 2800 TPI, you know, three points on tight. Uh, second one would be like, uh, like King Doc, same kind of a story. Third Renegade and four Parfait. You know, none of those bulls set the world on fire for any one trait. They're just easy to use. And so I think that they're coming back to, oh, need some easy to use bulls and, and um, go that way. And Lionel is another one of those bulls. Selling, like he's one, he's one of the top selling bulls too because they're good cattle. And, and, and they're gonna do what they, what they ask. You know, they, they perform, um, they perform. And there, there's, there's markets that, uh, that need that as well. I saw a jersey in the background. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Um, that's a really good question. Yep, there's one right there. Yep. So that's actually the, the genetic facility where that cow is at. Uh, we do once in a while uh, house, um, house, house some cows for our neighbors. 
because uh, we have an IVF lab right on site, you know, that they can drag them through. So we, we, we let a neighbor uh, have a cow there for, for a couple weeks while they were IVF here. That way they didn't have to drag her back down. So, yeah, it's okay. It was a fun project. You have to buy a quota to do this expansion? Or? Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, Land Lakes uh, uh, aren't going to let us uh, go all willy nilly. So uh, part of part of our deal, we've been busting the trails down, trying to find quota, you know, by any means necessary within our milk shed. Um, it's been it's been wildly expensive to the point where it probably costs us more money to buy the quota to milk one cow than it does to milk the cow. That puts that. Uh, Kind of you know mental price range of where we're at right now so we uh yeah it's been fun but we're really close to being, to, to being having the quota that we need for the new barn so uh one of the cool things about sandy valley they have an agriculture base right now and so when we move cows and consolidate those um, here to to our uh, to our facilities um we're going to still wet the uh, the agriculture base because if, if you don't use it, you lose it. So we're gonna keep wetting that base at uh, the current uh, 3,000 cow there. You're probably gonna push, you know, 500 to, uh, to, to 1,500 cows through there, uh, depending upon how much milk that they're, that they're gonna need. But uh, it allows us to move cows out of Sandy Valley and still, steep, and still keep uh, some base wet. So, and right now, Sandy Valley actually serves as a, as a pregnant barn. So we send cows up there after they're confirmed pregnant. All the high genomic uh, cattle live in our genomic, uh, uh, you know, our genetic facility. Um, all the open cows, they just, they just all mix. I, I would say we're probably right now a, uh, a trucking farm with a cow problem. So that's hence the consolidation of uh, what we got going on. Uh, he's shaking his head. He knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, as you're running pots all over uh, God's creation, <clears throat> three, four days a week. Yeah, it's not enough, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, and do the students have any questions? Think we're crazy? <laughs> okay, cool. We do too. <laughs> well, we'd like to thank George for coming today. Good. And I'd like to thank Bridgewater for allowing us to have this reader seminar here. It's it's a great location. It gives you guys an opportunity to hear him. And um, also, one thing I failed to mention was that um, Farm Bureau Bruce Vanderpool from Painesville came for lunch today. So Jordan will be around for a few minutes if you guys want to ask him any questions. So before my guys leave, we'd like to get a picture of you guys with Jordan, Tammy would. So um, if you guys would, where do you want the picture taken? Just up front? Bring your sheets over here and then gather up front so we get a picture. Thank you. 
Yeah, I thought he 